the John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I fucking love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that boss the next. Big jab there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Down goes Duffy O'Connor. Frank Mir does it again. Rock him, sock him, robots here. Oh my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self involved bullshit artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, best part of Ken Flo's week. Probably not. Maybe <laughs> now that he has a newborn. It's Monday, June 21, 2021, episode 305 of the Anik and Florian podcast. All right, I got three kids, one of whom, the youngest of whom, will be three years of age in two days. I'm feeling for my guy, Ken Flo. I mean, how is how is Archie <laughs> Florian adjusting to life uh, on this planet? Uh, he, he's doing okay. You know, um, my, my wife hasn't had a whole lot of sleep. Um, I, I get a little bit more sleep these days, but I have an immense respect, uh, for those that have more than two, like yourself, like my brother, Keith and et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, it's tough just managing all cause you know, giving the appropriate attention and dealing with both and, you know, one feeling potentially left out or trying to manage them both when they're both going. It's a, it, it's a lot. (laughs) It's an interesting conversation, right? Because I never could have seen the upside of not having children until I actually had my own children. And certainly it is life's greatest joy and the anticipation to come home and see my kids after I've been away from them for 48 hours with respect to my wife. The anticipation the to see my children is absolutely off the charts. Yeah. Uh, but man, when people tell me they're having a baby or they have a newborn, it's like my instinct is more condolence than congratulations at this <laughs> point in my life. And I did not intend to open the show this way, but uh, yeah, man, early on in the it. process, and I, you know, True was so easy. Archer's been more of a you know, Dick. It, it, Dick it's been, <laughs> exactly. it's been tough, man. It's been tough uh, the whole sleep thing, but uh, we'll get through it, man. We'll get yeah. through it. All right, so a lot to get to today, and it's great to have you with us for the 305th edition. Forrest Griffin is scheduled to join us. Hey. He's going to be by phone and not computer. He was all locked in a few weeks ago on Monday, May 17th, Archer's birthday. So right. we postponed your guy, Forrest, because cool. we figured you should be here when cool. uh, when he was on the podcast for the first time in about 100 episodes. Uh, Ray Longo is going to join us here shortly. I did have Ray scheduled off the top of the show today to try to make amends with that fucking guy after uh, – <laughs> I allegedly threw him firmly under the bus last week, but of course here we are, eleven oh two and counting, and he's not here. So. You didn't have any visitors, any any Italian visitors knock on your door uh, recently, right? No. Don't or answer no. the door, dude. You see an Italian guy yeah, knocking right. on your door, right. you're, you're somewhere else. I hate to say it because I do not like living in a gated community, but most of Florida is gated communities. Right. Ray Longo's not on the list. He's not on the permanent <laughs> list. I don't know what to tell you. He's not Don't getting let him in. on. All right, so we're going to recap this Korean zombie Ige card. We will get a prediction from Ken Flo as well on Cyril Gan and Alexander Volkov. I absolutely love this main event, and, and once again, I'm thankful that uh, that our executive producer, Cody Merrow, does not make me make predictions on this program. Uh, some PFL stuff as well. Anderson Silva with an outstanding result in boxing over the weekend. So a lot to get to today. I would love to lead the show with Kakara Vina Janji Doba because you can argue she was the most impressive athlete on the weekend, as the Brits like to say. But Ken Flo, Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie. I had not seen this man fight live since the Dennis Bermudez fight in February of 2017. And, and what an absolute treat. And a big part of the narrative for us as commentators leading into the fight was don't sleep on this man's wrestling and grappling because he is very much elite down there. What would you make of the Korean zombie over five rounds over uh, over a very game Danny game? You know, I, I can break down fights all day long. I, I, I feel like that's, you know, certainly one of my strengths. Predicting fights is not, okay? Uh, and I think a lot of that comes down to me going, well, they've been fighting this way. They're probably going to switch things up and fight this way this time. Or I'll, you know, and vice versa, I'll say they've been fighting like this for a long time. They're probably going to fight like this long, you know, the, the, the next fight. Uh, and managing that, I think, is the most difficult thing for me in predicting fights. And I thought Dan Ige was going to find himself in a war, in a classic Korean zombie style slugfest. Yeah. And if that was the case, Dan Ige was, I thought, was going to get the better of him. I just think he's a more powerful puncher. Well, this Korean zombie was, I thought, very different than previous Korean zombies. I thought he fought 
intelligently. I thought he was using his jab, right? Uh, the ultimate range finder with your hands, something he typically doesn't do um, and, and establishes range and not let guys just come in whenever they want. He did not trade. He was not foolish. He wasn't overly aggressive. I thought this was a measured intelligent approach from Korean zombie where we got a chance to see um, all of his skills. And I, I thought this was the best Korean zombie I've seen in a very long time, John. And this is the way you beat Dan Ige, who exactly. will be heard from in the future. But to these coaches, Eddie Cha and Santino DeFranco and the training partners, right? The elite level wrestlers, Olympic medalists, Henry Cejudo and Mark Madsen. Eddie Cha has basically demanded that heretofore every training camp for Chan Sung Jung be here in the States, in Arizona. And they weren't able to do that because of COVID-19 leading into the Brian Ortega fight. And I'm not sure anybody was beating T-City on that fateful night on Fight Island, right? But the point remains, he's getting a lot of good wrestling. He's getting a lot of good nuanced training. And mm -hmm. even when he did have that training camp in Korea, Eddie Cha had to do a 14-day quarantine. So some of it was remote. Brutal. Everything's aligned for the Korean zombie. And we will have more on that with Ray Longo, who now joins us. Uh, Raymond, Oh, it's great to see you. Oh, hey, there oh, you are. Good morning. Oh, man, morning. holy crow. I didn't, I didn't think I was coming into the studio that quick. Well, it's great to see you. We don't have the whole Ray Longo minute drop and all that stuff. Uh, I did buy a couple T-shirts today, by the way. Oh, uh, wow. Thank Ray you. Longo minute shirts. You're welcome. We're just trying to line your pocket. Um, <laughs> so we wanted to have you off, off the top of the show this week because, once again, the minute men are all over me. And I don't even bring this up to be funny, right? But – uh. I mean, you just have a lot of support on this podcast. Like, if I even joke with you about an answer being too long, I have half the listenership after me. So uh, here he is, guys. Ray Longo off the top of the show. Hope everybody's happy. <laughs> wow. I tell you, Kenny, what, what am I censoring with him? Uh, no, he's, no, no. he's angry. He's upset. Okay, he's, he's, angry. Got, he's actually an the angry Ray Longo army. The Ray Longo yeah. army fired back at John, and now All John right. is behaving himself. All right, you're Simple misbehaving, that. John. Don't make us give you a timeout now. You're a legend. I am not, okay? Oh, Let's be yeah, clear. no, you're a legend. But I think some people are like, hey, this is free form. It's a podcast. Like, let yeah, Ray man. go as long as he goddamn well pleases. So uh, that message was sent repeatedly. It was heard, <laughs> and here is your host trying to uh, – <laughs> to be a little bit more respectful. So are we leading the show with Steve Lee or the Korean zombie? I don't know which way we should go. Cody Merrow, our producer, tells me that Steve Lee kind of got fucking hosed over the weekend. So man, I'll tell you what, man. I thought he won the fight. I had no questions about it, but uh, it was one of those nights, man. We weren't going to get any kind of close decisions or anything. But uh, yeah. I thought he fought, everybody fought great. But we came out on the losing end of a couple of fights. We won a couple, but... um. Yeah, crazy, crazy night. But I, the, the way these guys fought was unbelievable. So that's really all that matters. They're amateurs. They're getting all this stuff out of their system. You know what I mean? Nobody's fought within like two or three years. So right. It was uh, it was it was good being it was good being back on the local circuit though. That that was good. But Steve Lee's uh, still an amateur. Still an amateur. What's the weight only, class? Uh, thirty-five. Thirty-five. Same weight 30. class as me. If we need to get this guy a W, man, twenty twenty-three, <laughs> just fucking. He can light me up all he wants, man. I would say, you know, that's really a great idea. I really like it. <laughs> John's <laughs> willing to sacrifice for that. I that's, tell you, John, you, you just, John, you give me a word. We just come up with a different huh. name for you. Yeah. Shave your mustache off. We throw you in there. Yeah. All right. That's we'll it. See. So when we brought you on, we were talking about Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie. And, uh, we shouldn't make light of, of just how much pressure is on this man every time he competes. You know, in, in his dream scenario, he would be fighting Ken Flo three rounders, co-main events on pay-per-view, right? But this guy, it's one main event after the next, has a whole country sort of on his shoulders. And by the way, we'll get to Sung Woo Choi, who is certainly going to lighten that load, I think, for the Korean zombie. What an absolute stud he is. But uh, once again, man, Chan Sung Jung, with all the pressure in the world on him, uh, shows a very layered game. What do you think of uh, Chan Sung Jung over the weekend, Raymond? Very uh, smart and intelligent fight against a, you know, real dangerous guy who likes to throw. <clears throat> Again, never, you know, Ige, Ige is a great kid, too. You know, you could see just. Don't let Dominic Cruz screw you up on the Ige pronunciation. Okay? No, I don't even know. Is it Ige? Ige? Nailed it. <laughs> Which it's one? hard. I think people see that eye, Ken Flo, right? It is Ige. Ige, yeah. Ige, yeah. I mean, you could just see what a personality this kid has. But uh, the zombie was on the money, man. He, you know, used the jab, mixed up the takedowns. He fought an MMA fight, you know, which is yeah. uh, 
what you're supposed to do, you know, mix up everything. And I think that's what he did. They caught him off guard. I think he's in a great camp. I think uh, Santino DeFranco is one of the better trainers out there right now. You know, he's right where he wants to be. And I think, yep. uh, you know, game plan wise, they had that thing locked down and uh, the zombie was able to stay focused and pull it off. Kenny, in terms of Dan Ige and his ceiling, I still think it's championship. I, I still believe that he can make a run. He's on the right side of 30. Uh, but if you were in Ige's corner, I mean, I don't know that he could have done anything all that differently. Um, it maybe have been a, a touch more aggressive late, I guess, if you're really fishing. You know, I thought yeah. Ige fought quite well. What would you think of the uh, the loser in this exchange? Danny, you know, uh, he's one of those guys you can depend on. He's always going to show up and he's always going to do his best. He's never going to check out of a fight. I think what we did see, though, was a, a guy in Danny Gay that just needs to get, you know, some better fundamentals. That's all, you know, clean up his technique a little bit. He's ne was never really known as the guy who's like, you know, very precise and uber technical. He's a powerful kid who is as tough as nails. Uh, he's always going to give his best. He's always going to come in shape. Um, and, and he's got that power that he can rely on at times. But setting it up, um, utilizing all of his tools um, fluidly uh, is something he can work on. I think uh, there's a lot of MMA fighters that, that need to do that. We all need to do that as martial artists. But I think just sharpening up uh, technique here and there, um, I think what would, would serve him well, that that's going to be that stuff that you do in between training camps. And uh, I'm sure he'll be back better. Uh, I think Korean Zombie's experience – um, and the fact that, uh, you know, he fought intelligently, like Ray say, Ray said was the difference. And he just teased his own comeback in that answer. If you were paying attention closely enough, so Michael Bisping in our fighter meeting, Ray asked the Korean zombie about the pressure to live up to the nickname, right? I mean, you see like his name's not even on the fight car, right? It's zombie versus Ige on all the graphics, you know? Um, so, but he doesn't fight like that he doesn't fight like he needs to brawl anymore if he did at one point right like he he has a lot of game on the floor and he certainly wasn't afraid to use it this night yeah and, that, and that's the amazing part because a lot of times it's hard to change when you're in those brawls uh who was the guy he had that first brawl with from uh jackson wink yeah right? rodriguez no, no no years ago oh um you know what i'm talking about I, uh, i'll look it up yeah, but, you know, like that guy, he could never break out a brawl. Oh, Leonard Garcia. Uh, Leonard Garcia, right? Didn't they fight? Yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I mean, like, Leonard, Leonard could never break out of that. The, fa the fact that the zombie was able to go back and utilize his jab and stay, you know, focused and not get caught in those brawls, I think is, a, is that's a big step in the right direction for that guy. Yeah. All right, so I mentioned the name Yair Rodriguez. And obviously, he is no longer aligned with the Jackson Wink MMA Academy. He's in Chicago with Mike Valley and Bilal and all those guys. So, featherweight's a little bit log jam right now, Ken Flo. You're going to have Brian Ortega and Alexander Volkanovsky fight, but Max Holloway is the number one contender, and when he comes back later this year, it could easily be in a championship setting. I mean, he's coming off what I believe is the greatest singular performance in UFC history. Yair Rodriguez hasn't fought since 2019 and was to face Holloway July 17th in a main event. Seems as though Giga Chikadze has been offered the July 17th slot against Yaya Rodriguez, who as yet has not accepted. So, uh, Kenny, I'll start with you. I guess there's no obvious answer. I mean, I certainly believe that the Korean Zombie or Max Holloway could find themselves in a title fight. You just never know. But what do you think they're going to do with uh, with the Korean Zombie? Might even be Max, actually, in a main event. Jeez. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of different possibilities. I love I love all of those options. I, I think Korean Zombie is a big enough name, and he's a guy who's always going to deliver, you know, action-packed fights. Um, and and I, I imagine he probably wants to stay pretty busy at this point. You know, um, I, I love a lot of those options. You know, he may find himself, uh, you know, close to, um, you know, fighting one of those number one contender guys like a Holloway. Um, but, uh, at this point, I think maybe getting another fight, uh, I don't know. It, Giga, Giga's trying to get the fight uh, against yeah. Yair. Is that right? Yes. Giga's number 10 in the world. And I would think would be somewhat of an avoided man. What's nice about him is that he's ready, willing, and able to fight, you know, six times a year, uh, yeah, and I, tougher down to 46. Right. I think if Yair is, um, 
I don't think Yair would probably take the Giga fight, but Korean Zombie and Giga kind of makes sense. That'd be an awesome fight. Right, and that could potentially happen. But I would like to see Chan Sung Jung, as his father named him, uh, <laughs> get, a, get a get a co event. That? He keeps, on a, uh, he keeps confusing me. I, yeah. I thought we were on the zombie. What, yeah, what, I guess. Uh, who's the, right, yeah, right. Chan Sung Jung. Who's that? Carl All Young? Right. Who is so that? Ray. Carl How about Jung. this? So yeah. uh, Marlon Chito Vera is an animal and a Bantamweight contender that I do think one day will fight for a title. So yeah. we're going into the archives here, Ray. I think you'll enjoy this. So here is a text from Marlon Chito Vera to Kenny Florian, January 9th, 2020. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Um, Kenny, I was looking at old footage of you and the elbows always were nasty. Any advice on how to put it right? Or is it more endurance on the bone to cut? I use a lot, but looking for advice there. And here's the reply from Ken Flo. This is uh, about 18 months ago, two months before COVID-19. My dude, hope you're well. The biggest thing is swinging your elbow and then letting it go loose. This creates a whipping motion that ends up cutting the skin much easier. What a fucking savage, Ken. <laughs> Very similar to how one throws a punch, the structure of the arm slash elbow is what is supporting the fist or elbow. It's like throwing a baseball, generate power, and then let the elbow go loose until impact. And then Cheeto responded, so awesome to read this, my man. And I had that same sentiment when this was shared with me over the weekend. So uh, Cheeto knows how to throw an elbow. Leaned on Ken Flo and Johnny Bones a little bit. How about fucking Cheeto Vera, Ray? What'd you think of that? Yeah, I I agree with you. I think Cheeto is the... uh... He just keeps getting better and better. I think he's got the right disposition. Um, you know, he's had, you know, he, fought, he did fight Aldo. He's fought some good guys, big names now. I think he's got confidence, definitely not going away easy. And I agree with you. I think if he stays the course, he will fight for the championship one day. Kenny, as far as I'm concerned, he has arguably the best striking coach in Jason Perillo, arguably the best nutritionist. I think it's Michelle Ingalls from Perfecting Athletes. Everything is locked in. Daryl Christian with the wrestling. All the will that you could possibly need and then some. I don't know if he'll be champion, but um, he's certainly leaving no stone unturned in trying to get there. Hunger is the thing that really stands out for me. This dude loves to fight. He's hungry. He's still got that nast nastiness in him, which every fighter, if you're competing, you need to have. Um, and uh, yeah, I agree with Ray. I, I think he is improving. My concern heading into that fight when we talked about the pot, you know, talked about that fight on the pa- podcast last week was his slow starting ability. Sometimes he gets off to a slow start. It's also because Davey Grant is really good as well. The the kid is damn good, and he's also tough as fucking nails. Unbelievable. But, um, yeah, I I think that he got off to a little bit of a slow start. But once he found his rhythm, once he started letting loose and relaxing, uh, Cheeto Vera was on fire, man. Um, some Some of the most beautiful clinch, knee, and elbow combinations you will see outside of Muay Thai. Um, fight it, it was it was really pretty to watch and man did that guy follow uh, the elbow protocol uh, perfectly um, and it, it, again it showed how much elbows and even just one of them and he, and he threw more than several how one elbow and one elbow cut could change a fight completely it, it's why they're so valued in Muay Thai and why they they are such a weapon in all of combat hand to hand Um it was it was really pretty to watch, and it was brutal. It was violent, uh, and it swung the fight his way. Ray, what percentage of UFC athletes know how to loosely throw an elbow, so to speak? I'm I'm tr- I truly don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I don't know. Right. Uh, I mean, Al Al had a couple of knockouts with elbows. He yeah. not only cut you, he knocked you. He he knocked out Ross Pearson, I think. He knocked out uh, the kid on the show that you you uh, commentated. Uh, I hope, I, you know, if that's something in your arsenal, you're gonna you're gonna probably you know do exactly that. Reach out to Kenny and or well, guys that throw them, and then you just experiment with them. But uh, I don't know, percentage wise, I don't know. Kenny, give me, <laughs> help me out. No, I mean, hey, not, Kenny, not I, you a whole lot of people though, right? I mean, yeah, you know, you're, you're not seeing you're not seeing it a lot. If that's yeah. you know, so if you're basing it on that, then there's not a lot. 
Kenny, yeah. is the technique the same if you're throwing it to try to knock somebody out versus slicing them open? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely want to loosen up a little bit, um, right. you know, no matter what. I think, you know, it, Bruce Lee used to talk about that. You know, you you, you strike like a whip, you know, all of his strikes. All of your like strikes. Open but, fist, like open yeah, fist. Oh, the op open fist, you know, when, when you're talking about cutting, I, I think that it's especially important with the elbow. If you're looking for a knockout shot, there's going to be way more follow through with your body, similar to like a cross or whatever with the hip getting involved a little bit more but um yeah i i feel like it's a weapon that because maybe i mean obviously you can't really throw it and sparring very much right yeah um but you know putting some elbow pads on and, and i'm sure ray did this back in the day with jeet kundo and muay thai putting the elbow pads and having control and and, and working at sparring is going to get your body and mind to throw it when you actually have a fight and i think the big uh, hurdle or obstacle is guys aren't able to really throw it in sparring, especially full out. So then when the fight comes around, they're not throwing it at all. So um, you got to train your body and mind to throw those guys. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a weapon that's that's very often left on the table when it comes to a real fight. Yeah, well, let me just say another one more thing, John, is that some guys, I mean, there is a difference in people's elbows too. Some guys' elbows, John, it's just like a bone right waiting sure. to cut you. Like there right. is, you know, some of the guys like uh, that have a little meat on their arms, you get more of a different type of elbow, like a Tyson. He's just going right. to almost right. pour on you. But some of those guys that have those exposed elbows, and there's a difference, man, because I've seen it really, really crazy. And you got to loosen up your lats, your back. If you have, if you got a like a big, but you're not getting the talk like Kenny's talking about on those elbows. Right. So, the, the body mechanics, the way your body structure is, yeah. uh, I think it's a, a huge thing to the elbows. And like Kenny said, and just wanting to throw them. Like I just had a guy do a spin el spin back elbow uh, a Sunday or Saturday during sparring. And, uh, you know, he controlled it. So you can do it. You just have to take something off. You need responsible people. But what a beautiful technique he threw and, you know, would have landed. But he just stopped it perfectly. So. Right. Uh, you know, because he didn't have elbow pads on her. I'm sure he would have thrown it, but yeah. yeah. That's a good point about bone structure. And I know a lot of people, Kenny, are still audio only, but for the viewers, would you mind just holding up your elbow, the one that <laughs> Chris, uh, yeah. Ray, Ray was talking about guys with muscle, a little bit more meat on the I was not one of those guys with a whole hey, lot of muscle on my body. So, that's you the know. elbow, folks, right there. That's that the elbow, elbow cut a lot of people, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ken Flo's elbow, something else. All right, so as we spin this thing forward for Chito Vera, maybe Marab Dwalish Willie and Aljamain Sterling will be preparing for those elbows in the not-too-distant future. But here's the thing, okay? Dominic Cruz is one of my best friends in the world, my broadcast partner. So he and I have talked about this Chito Vera fight in the past. And by the way, I consider Chito uh, a dear friend as well. Like, wedding tomorrow, Chito's probably getting a fucking invite. Not a groomsman like Cruz would potentially be. But I don't know if C Cruz is a borderline groomsman right now. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> but he and I talked about the merits of this Cheeto fight, Kenny, not all that long ago when it actually made more sense when Cheeto, I think, was either on a winning streak or before the Jose Aldo fight. And it's, it's not as though the fight doesn't make any sense for Dominic Cruz, but I just want to set this up a little bit. So Marlon Cheeto Vera is number 15 in the world. Magic Marlon Marais is number six, and he is fighting 10th ranked Marab Dwalish Willie, right? So you can't mm -hmm. always fight up the rankings as ninth ranked Absolutely. Dominic Cruz is trying to do. So Cruz, I think, would love to fight a guy like Rob Font, who's in the top three, but Rob Font doesn't want to fight Dominic Cruz because he just won a title eliminator essentially against Cody Garbrandt in the main event. He's not going to fight Cruz, which is obviously a, a, a tricky side to go down. To, so I understand yeah. why guys certainly don't want to fight down in certain instances. Um, I think the Cruz Cheeto fight makes sense, but Dominic at this point of his career, Kenny is looking up and um, you know, the 15 ranking doesn't necessarily get him out of bed, even though I think for a lot of people that fight makes a lot of sense. Your thoughts. Absolutely. You know, there's fighting and then there's the business of fighting and uh, it, it always gets trickier. It's kind of like more money, more problems, more rankings, more problems as well. So Act. the higher ranked, the higher ranked you go, the, the trickier it is, because also, you know, um, you have to be more precise and, and I think uh, more careful, you know, you know, what people also need to understand. Right. It's it's not just the fighter. 
making the decisions. You have a coach. You got a manager. You got, you know, uh, the manager's assistant. You got the UFC. You got all these other people that are involved in this process, and it can get tricky at times. Now, you know, some guys, they don't care. that They're going to fight whoever, um, you know, and, and you can get mixed results uh, because of that. Um, I think when you get a guy, a legend, a true legend like a Dominic Cruz, I give him a whole lot more leeway because he's been around the sport for a long time. He has fought all those other guys when he was coming up in the game. He knows what that's like. He's already done that. Yeah. Um, I think if, if you're going to give leeway, um, I think – you give a guy like a Dominic Cruz, who's been a former champion, both in the WEC and in the UFC, you, you give him more room. You give him you give him more ability to be able to pick those fights. I, I mean, that's the way I see it anyway. How about Ray breaking that Marais Marab news on the Anakin Florian oh, podcast? Wow, that was We've like, got a little bump from that, Ray. Thank you. I thought I was in trouble. <laughs> Never. No, you were in exactly. trouble for your three-minute answer, not for <laughs> I was panicking. So... I'm just curious, Kenny, in terms of coaches, managers getting involved with fight decisions, you don't have to answer this, but you kind of do. Was there ever a fight that you really wanted to take maybe early in your career or otherwise that a coach or manager prevented you from taking? Because I, right. I don't think a coach or manager in your situation would have had enough. I mean, even Keith, right? Like I would think you and Keith would have been pretty aligned, but you seem too strong-willed. That if you thought cerebrally that a matchup made sense at that point in time, nobody, manager, coach, Keith, or anyone was going to be able to talk you out of it. Strong-willed is a euphemism for me being dumb. No, let's see. Uh, I think that. Well, I, listen for the Sean Shirk fight when it was first when it was first proposed. Um, I think myself. And my coaches were like, Kenny, you need more time. This dude's right, got right. 40 fights. You're just coming off a fight. And I think the UFC wanted to do like a month turnaround. And, um, you know, my back wasn't uh, 100%. That really rarely was. But um, they said, hey, let, let's get more time. Let's ask the UFC if they could push that event back or, or put you on another show. And that's what we ended up doing. I'm trying to think of a an opponent that I didn't accept. I I don't know. I, Taking I don't, them all. It takes on all comers. Just one fight on the prelims. But uh. Well, you know, I think I was lucky back then. Now there's so many different fighters. I mean, back back then there was like a couple hundred fighters in the UFC, two, like 200 yeah. maybe right. around. And now there's what, 600, something like that? So there's a lot more options. Yeah. Back then there wasn't as many options. So I, I don't know if I really uh, had a ton of options to even say no or yes or, yeah. you know. But the, the Sean Shirk fight is one of those that come to mind where I was yeah, like, I need more time. I didn't have a whole lot of fights back then. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what Kenny said, there weren't options and guys were just looking to fight. No, but I don't think anybody was turning down anything. I don't think you could have turned down anything back then or they would have got rid of you. I think it was definitely, yeah. you, there was, you didn't even need yeah. a manager. That guy was going to do nothing for you back then. Uh, right or wrong, though. I mean, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. no, I don't think you, a no, lot of people. At the end absolutely. of the day, it's really, the fight is making the call. You know, because you could put, you could have your input in there, but when a guy wants to do what he wants to do, he's going to do it. Yeah, you know, that's it. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people love telling Joe Silva no. Incidentally, but uh, Kenny, did you see Sung Woo Choi over the weekend? Ray, did you see Sung Woo Choi against Julian Rosa on the main card? I did. I saw the knock. That was one of the few prelims I saw. Yeah, that was well, nasty. No, this dude. was actually on the main card. Oh, it was added okay, sorry, to the sorry, main sorry. card. That's the one of the um, early fights. I'm sorry. Yes, yes you're but right. I didn't see the knock. Either way, yeah. it was an early show. So uh, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah. But dude, this Sung Woo Choi. I told you guys my new favorite fighter is Brad Riddell. Now I'm trying to decide: is it Riddell or Sung Woo Choi or Vina Janji Doba? Um, Ray Sung Woo fucking Choi. And and then the post fight <laughs> interview. You know, with the English, right, and willingness to, I mean, I'm telling you, like, if Sung Woo Choi stays on this path and embraces learning English, it ain't just going to be the Korean zombie. This kid can be an absolute star. What do you think? Yeah, well, look, I, I saw, you got to remember, I was at the fights that night, so I came home late and I tried to watch everything. So I saw the knockout, but I didn't see the interview. But he looked, from what I saw, which was short, he looked good, but I'd have to see a lot more. Kenny, yes, it was a uh, 97-second fight, but uh, chips in the center of the table for me on Sung Woo Choi. 
Hey, he's a dangerous dude, man. And, and again, you got to put it in the context of who he fought. I, I think Julian Rose is a very tough kid, man. Uh, he, he He's really good everywhere. Um, he got caught. They were both going for hooks, I believe. Um, and uh, Rosa got caught with, with the heavier shot, uh, got got dropped, and then was taken out. Excellent killer instinct. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. Five knockouts in 12 fights. This show certainly did not set any record for uh, most fight time in UFC history. Hey, Ray, anything else before uh, before we let you fly? I would just like to add that if that is a natural tan, it must have been very nice in New York over the weekend. You look well, good. The weather's been really good. And it's, of course, it's natural. No, I know it's natural. But uh, he's um, always digging, always digging. No, I mean, I'm not. So, uh, yeah, I think we've sold like 75 T-shirts. So, oh, uh, man. So, Look uh, at the smile on his face. Yeah, and Cody, I told like Cody. Real entrepreneur. He could, yeah. Well, and I bought two more Ray Longo Minute T-shirts today. This really isn't a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> I'm just excited to buy my Lambo with, with Ray Longo money, kid. I'm just I'm I'm going to be I mean, a couple of Ray one, one Lambo for you, Joe, one Lambo for me. We're making money oh, off of this guy. Imagine Great. This. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I can't yeah. wait till the next Ring of Combat show. You're just you're, you're not gonna be able to avoid that T-shirt. It's just gonna be all over the crowd. You know, so, July seventeenth. There you go. So when will I see you next on the UFC Road Show? Do you know the answer to that? Because Kenny and I are getting together in Vegas in a couple of weeks, and uh, we'd love to have. Hell you. yeah! Wow. Wait, wait, wait. Before I just real quick, how long was the quarantine in Jersey this time? Same thing, or do you know if they oh, had the same? Us- I, it's yeah. less now. It was, dude. The original one, I think, was seventeen days. Now I think it's like uh, nine days, maybe for ten fighters. days for for the fighters. For the fighters. For me, it's I don't have a quarantine right, now. Right, but, right. Uh, we get tested so. every day. But wow, yeah. And it looks like the PFL finals, if I'm not mistaken, are going to be in the Sunshine State here in Florida. So uh, the 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 semi the semifinals semifinals. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Ray. Well, uh, as they say, have a great day and a better evening if you don't have anything else. But we appreciate you joining us off the top of the show. You are still the star of the show. And I appreciate you. Unlike a lot of these fighters, you're not all up in your feelings. So you forgave me and we're moving on. Yeah, you got to you got to be able to bust balls in life, man. That's I it. think so. I mean, I'm just having fun. I'm just oh, having Ray, fun. I, I still told him if an Italian guy knocks on his door, don't open it. <laughs> right, right. Don't <laughs> open it. And that Florida... As a lot of Italian guys. <laughs> exactly. yeah. A lot He's of New Yorkers. No, he'd actually have no place to hide. They have, whatever you do, <laughs> don't make the mistake and send me your address for anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good advice. <laughs> Down here in New York South. Uh, all right, Ray. How about Matt Brown, by the way? Oh, yeah. Years old, huh? oh, yeah. Yeah, that looked great. Yeah. Still has the nasty in him. He still yeah. has the nasty prick in him, and the power yeah. uh, does not die at 40. Great. All right, buddy. Well, uh, thanks for your contributions. Oh, next week, here's what we're doing. What are we doing? We're doing a live Q&A, right? Because uh, it's sort of an unorthodox week for us. There's no UFC show on my birthday, July 3rd. So we will do a live Q&A. We will solicit questions up front. You can also come into the chat room and join us live, and it will be the three of us. So uh, more details to follow on that. But, uh, you know, I'm excited. might have to cancel a private or two. Uh, there's no problem. I'm just kidding. I'm I'm really, I don't have to work anymore with the T-shirt sales. <laughs> right. I don't have a, what private you're talking about? That's good. That's good. No, I can't wait till you actually get a check for the T-shirts, and then uh, yeah. we'll have that conversation. All right. Well, have a great day and uh, enjoy your cold brew and all that. And we'll talk to you uh, next Monday. Take it easy, guys. I'll talk yeah. to you. Right. Ray Longo, if you see dot com slash af, escape the shrubs and weeds this summer with shine at manscaped dot com slash af. All right, before we move on to Rory McDonald and uh, and Gleason Tebow, Matt Brown and Diego Lima, Kenny, have both been chasing this moment that materialized for Matt Brown over the weekend. And I think when you evolve as a mixed martial artist and you're devoted to the lifestyle and you have no negative emotions that come with training, you still believe that you can go out there and present your best version to date, even if you are 40 years of age. Yeah. So for three or four fights now, Matt Brown has been saying, like, I still have the ultimate highlight in me. And then the motherfucker goes out and does it, you know, um, as a plus 180 underdog. So uh, what do you have for us on uh, the 40 year old Matt Brown coming up large? 
I don't want to turn this into an ass kissing uh, event ah. here with, 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 for, for you, John. But I, I think what, you know, one of your strengths is always having that information that kind of gives people the context of what's going on. And I think, and, and it's something I didn't even realize. So you know, awesome information there. When you mentioned the fact that Matt Brown was one of Diego Lima's coaches uh, on the Ultimate Fighter, right? One of his strike coaches. So yeah. that's going to kind of play into your mind a little bit. And I think that that definitely played a role when you're when you're fighting a dude who was your mentor you know you're going to be playing second fiddle out there and you may allow that person to lead the dance a little bit and I think that's kind of what happened even in his good moments Diego Lima never looked settled he never looked so comfortable out there a lot of that had to do with the pressure of Matt Brown but you wonder what that kind of big brother mentality did to him as he fought so I thought that was really interesting uh tidbit of information there that gave us a good context and background of what was going on um Thanks, but buddy. yeah Matt Brown man he he's he's a nasty dude and he still loves to <laughs> fight and man did he land that shot from hell that was just brutal he believed in the process even though he was eating a lot of leg kicks to the calf and to yeah, the man. leg um, and kept coming forward and landed that big shot for the finish, man. It, it was an awesome fight, and Diego Lima was fighting a pretty good fight yeah. too. He just he stayed in front of Matt Brown for a little bit too long and ate that shot at the wrong time. Eventually, Diego Lima is going to get somebody with these calf kicks, but it, it wasn't going to be Bilal Muhammad nor Matt Brown. Uh, and I will tell you, when Michael Bisping asked Matt Brown about any hesitation because of the history with Diego Lima, it was actually Lima who had some initial hesitation thinking, oh, I hope Matt's okay with this. But then he thought, man, Matt Brown's going to want me to sign on the dotted line. But it is crazy. Right. I think Matt Brown in 07 knocks out Douglas Lima. And then in 2021 at 40, Dude. knocks out his brother, Diego. I mean, it's wild. Matt Brown, one of the most decorated knockout artists in UFC history. And when we were hosting MMA Live at one point, you you may recall, you know, he had lost three in a row and it looked like maybe his job was on the line. And, uh, you know, borderline Hall of Famer as these credentials start to add up just with the legacy, man. You know, it's yep. like when you start to start to align yourself with these names like Belfort and St. Pierre and, and all these illustrious knockout artists, Derek Lewis, uh, quite the body of work in that round. And another dude, by the way, who, who actually knows how to use the elbows from the clinch. His knee elbow combinations are tremendous. He's the other, you yeah. know, one a handful of guys who who can do that. So and I just have to say, because we have to move on, and I don't I don't know if you saw Vina Janji Doba uh I did, it, I did it. So arm injury forced Kanako Murata out of the fight due to a doctor stoppage after 10 minutes. But I'm telling you, like as great as Murata is, former Invicta FC Strawway champion, judo player outstanding wrestler could have been an Olympian in Japan if she wanted to, but I'm sitting there looking at Bina Janji Doba minus minus one twenty five, And I'm like, what am I missing? Like she broke Mackenzie Dern's nose and it, she, it was like this version of Mackenzie Dern. Like she Top lost dude. to Mackenzie Dern, but yeah. world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, outstanding striker. Straw weight is an embarrassment of riches. Like Vina Janji Doba is the real fucking deal. She's must see television. And I'm really happy for her. And again, like Murata is a beast too, right? Murata got yeah. the red corner, even though she didn't have a ranking. So uh, Vina Janji Doba, we congratulate her. Chaos Williams, outstanding fighter. Uh, total commitment from him. Fought a very game. Matthew Semmelsberger uh, and and Ricky the Gladiator Glenn back for the first time in a long time with a big knockout of ne- Neto BJJ. Joaquim Zil- Silva, Casey O'Neill, big submission. Win. A, lot, a lot of competition for bonus money. Not a lot of judges scorecards needed. Great UFC fight night. Uh, Ken Flo was on the PFL sticks on Thursday night. So, um, Glayson Tebow over Rory McDonald. For those who did not see the fight, it looked like a huge upset, but you called the fight and you did not think the rightful winner had his hand raised. Is that the case? No, sir. I uh, I saw that, um, you know, for me, it was Rory McDonald that was really dictating the range. He was utilizing a lot of weapons. He was landing a lot of shots. Glayson Tebow, to his credit, and as tough as he is, uh, refused to go away. Uh, but he was landing, you know, he was he was getting landed on. He, he was uh, eating a lot of different shots. Um, you know, the versatility of, of Roy McDonald was on full display. Roy was able to take his back, hit, hit a takedown or two uh, against Glayson Tebow, something that is extremely rare. Glayson uh, really wasn't able to put Rory on his back at all. 
Um, and it looked like it was going to be a pretty easy unanimous decision or at least um, 29, uh, sorry, at least, uh, you know, 30, 27 uh, for me in my mind, I thought that's what it was going to be, or at wow. least a 29, 28 uh, decision for Roy McDonald. I thought the, the third round was the strongest one for Glayson, but um, I still thought it was pretty easy to call and, uh, man, you know, the judges, two judges saw it the other way. One judge saw it for Rory. Uh, and I was just baffled. You know, all of us were. Uh, yeah. You know, we have different ways of judging the the, the fights. Um, you know, we have this FPR thing. You know, Randy and I kind of chime in to think what we did. And verdict, we, we show the verdict right. uh, scorecard, what which is, you know, everyone say? chimes in with their own. And it just like across the board, it was all Rory. It was just. You know, right. how'd um, Pahupa it, score it in Glayson T Bow's corner? Yeah, <laughs> something tells me he probably had it for Glayson, but uh, yeah, wild stuff. And for Rory McDonald, he will have to look at that red stripe on his Wikipedia page forever. I, he doesn't strike me as a Wikipedia guy necessarily. And in your format, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but he still makes the playoffs, so doesn't really lose anything. Exactly, he, he advances. Um, you know, he now has to match up against Ray Cooper in the semifinals, which is a tough matchup, yeah. but. Either way, you know, he does advance. This is true. All right. And I don't think either of us saw Anderson Silva's win over Julio Cesar no. Chavez Jr., but uh, I, I'm i really excited about that. Even though How cool is that, man? It. You know, I just I pushed out a tweet Saturday night, and somebody's like, dude, what are you doing? I didn't even know that it was going on right after our show, and I actually could have seen it. But uh, pretty cool, man, you know, to see him in some of the highlights doing his thing. It's amazing. It's amazing. And again, it's a testament to him as a martial artist and his willingness and courage to, you know, step out of mixed martial arts and to compete in boxing against, you know, uh, the son of a of a true legend and Julio Cesar Chavez uh, Jr. And um, the fact that he was able to get it done against a dude that, that that's all he does. Uh, was amazing and you know it was kind of a it was a win for mixed martial arts you know mixed martial arts anytime we've been competing outside of that domain it, it yeah. hasn't gone so well so um anderson silva putting the mixed martial arts community on his back there a little bit pretty and cool i believe this is a tweet by the way from verdict on the mcdonald thing real quickly clearly defeated glason t bow on the global scorecard there's never been a point differential this big on verdict where the opposite fighter has won wow all right so that's that but yeah, pump for Anderson Silva, man. Absolutely pump for the guy. What a good fucking dude. Speaking of good dudes, what do you think about Tyron Woodley's chances against Jake Paul? No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to go there. Will you be betting on the fight, though? Or are you going to be betting on that fight? I'm absolutely going to be betting on the fight. I just will not be telling people uh, where my action is. <laughs> man, I will uh, I will be betting in my mind. Probably not actual money. But, right. uh, man, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be cheering for, for Tyron Woodley. That's for sure. Looks like Gamebred with his uh his bare knuckle boxing promotion, Gamebred Fighting or whatever it is, had yes. one of their first events. Mississippi Mean trademark Jason Knight uh was able to get a win, and I think I bring it up because I think they're paying the athletes uh some sort of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Yes, shift, you know, dude, that's awesome. You're know, thinking about the future. You know, hold on to your Bitcoin. It, it, it you know don't think about the price now. It's what it's going to be. So that's like your little retirement. Put that away. Forget about it. Secure it. Get your own wallet. Uh, hold on to it, and then look at it in five or ten years. Then, then, uh, then reap the rewards or put it away. Or you really should hold it forever. But anyways, um, you know, look into the future. I, I think that I think that's great for 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 the fighters that they have some kind of savings for later. That's right. the way I see it. Yeah, man, below thirty three. 32,000. Come on. Just <laughs> trying not to day to day watch yes. it. Yes. Keep I know. buying those dips, baby. Keep buying those dips. Absolutely. All right. That is going to do it for our recap. We will make some predictions for UFC fight night. Gone versus Volkov. We will get you our Anakin Florian podcast poll results. It was essentially 50% on both sides when I threw it out there this morning, but Cody will get those updated results today's main event challenge is brought to you by odd shark your source for the latest odds from leading authorities expert editorial content and detailed matchup picks with expert in-depth analysis for each game their free statistics numbers and trends will help you make the sharp picks on game day head over to odd shark and start playing like a shark today that's oddshark.com don't forget the second s let's make some picks it's the main event challenge and the time is most definitely now i finished fights I'm going to do everything possible to win. The Main Event Challenge. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. 
All right, joining us today to make selections, longtime Anakin Florian podcast listener, has his own podcast, by the way, and a massive mixed martial arts fan, David Hansen. David, it's good to see you, man. We appreciate the support, and uh, we'll see if you can take down the great Kenny Florian in what is not his strong suit. Just no. kidding. No, uh, it isn't. David, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, guys. Um, like I said, I appreciate you guys uh, giving me the opportunity to come on and talk with you guys, break down the fights for this weekend's uh, great fight card. You're goddamn right, David. Let's first update the standings. 2-2 two, two for Team Anakin, Team Florian last week. So it is 75-56, to 56, a 19-point deficit. Eesh. Kenny, you got some work to do. I mean, I, September, you might just have to start picking dogs. First fight for us today is going to be at light heavyweight. Danilo Marquez, minus 125. Kennedy in Zechiku, even money. So Fortis MMA is in Zechiku. Really starting to come into his own. Huge win, bonus knockout as an underdog after being sort of handpicked by... Carlos Olberg's head coach, Eugene Behrman, for that fight. Uh, Marquez out of Kings MMA has won four in a row. He's undefeated in the UFC. David, what do you think about this one at 205 pounds? So, well, obviously the last uh, outing for Nzechiku, he, um, he was getting kind of pieced apart by Olberg yeah. until he landed that, that massive shot to, um, to put him down. And with Danilo Marquez, he's – he's really good about pressing up against the fence using those really tricky sweeps and those trips to get his opponents down to the ground and use his ground and pound to work into a submission from there. And so I, I do believe that Danilo Marquez will be able to pull this one out with his takedown ability, being able to push in Zechiku up against the fence um, using those trips and then possibly look for a submission. And I would say round two. All right, I like that you're giving up the, us the method as well. Notice how David just pronounces in Zechiku like it's fucking nothing. Uh, Ken Flo, what do you think here? Interesting fight. I do think Marquez is going to uh, pursue a floor fight. What do you think about this matchup, and ultimately, uh, who wins it? Yeah, I, I think I think that's accurate. Um, I, I think in Zechiku uh, definitely is going to be a little bit more dangerous on the feet, um, but I do think Marquez will find a way to get to the clinch, take the fight to the ground, uh, control, and, and, and look for a win there, uh, or, or just win by decision by doing that again and again. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I think Danilo wins this. All right, both guys like Danilo Marquez. Odds today, courtesy of DraftKings Sportsbook. And it is Monday, so these numbers effectively will change. Saw a lot of movement on Ige and the Korean Zombie last week. It was a pick em up until Thursday or Friday. Ige closed about minus 152. Co-main event this weekend, David at heavyweight. Tanner, the bulldozer, Bozer, minus 150, taking on Oban St. Pru, plus 120. We'll need the round, the method of victory. So Bozer, if you follow him on social media, he asked to be turned around quickly for what is the final fight of his UFC contract. He started 3-1 and one in the UFC, and the only loss in that span came by decision to the credentialed Seattle gone. Now he's lost two straight, the last of which June 5th split decision uh, to the backyard shed Alir Latifi. So Bozer, his words, fighting for his job here against OSP. David, who do you have in the co-main event? So Bozer, he's got great footwork, especially for the heavyweight division. Um, I noticed that in his last fight, it looks like he came in a lot leaner than his previous fights. And with OSP, OSP's been around for a long time. You know, he was supposed to fight John Jones a long time ago. Or I believe, no, he did fight he John did. Jones a long He did fight John Jones a long time ago. And, you know, he was supposed to be like that next big thing, but... Everybody in the light heavyweight, heavyweight division is like the next big thing until they run into John Jones, as you guys all know. So with with OSP, he didn't have a good showing against Ben Rothwell up at heavyweight. Um, I'm very curious to see what he comes in on the scale at because this is a heavyweight fight. I'm hoping that he comes in around, you know, not so much around the heavyweight limit, you know, more or less like 220s. But I do think Bozer is going to be too elusive. And I think that um, OSP, he has a negative strike differential. You know, he's there to yeah, be hit. Does. And I, I think that Bozer is going to be able to get it done. I don't think that he's going to be able to take him out, but I think it's going to be by decision. All right, David likes Tanner Bozer by decision. Both of these guys, Kenny, are light for the weight class. St. Pru, 23-time UFC veteran, as you well know, hasn't fought since a TKO loss to Jamal Hill last December. He missed weight for that fight, but of course, this one is at heavyweight, so not an issue. He was going to face Maxim Grishin. He had to pull out due to visa issues. Ken Flo, OSP, Tanner Bozer, who do you have, and how do they get it done? 
You know, Ovin St. Pru, I, I think that, um, you know, his most dangerous weapons on the feet really is that left high kick. His left hand is pretty deadly if he's able to land it as you come in. Um, I, I think that Tanner Bozer is going to be ready for all those things. That what Tanner needs to be worried about, I think, more than anything else, is probably the takedown. I think Ovin St. Pru's ability to put you on your back, to set up that uh, Von Flew choke that he seems to get on everybody. Um his ground and pound, his control can be a problem. Um, I, I don't think that's going to happen against the larger Tanner Bozer. I, I do think his footwork um, is is very good for the most part uh, at heavyweight. I, I think he has some of the best footwork, actually. I think he hits hard when he's able to plant. I think he has a ton of, of potential. Um, so I like Tanner in this one. Um, you know, I think Tanner gets it done. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a stoppage. I need some extra points. Let's go with Tanner Bozer by TKO round two. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you on Bozer, at least in terms of the potential. I think three and three would have to classify as underachievement through six right. fights in the UFC. Granted, the last was a split unanimous against Arlovsky. Um, was close, I guess, but I thought Andre won that fight. So we'll see what Bozer has for uh, for St. Preux. All right, main event, our poll results still coming in. Essentially 50-50, according to you guys. I love this fight. Cyril Gan 155. Alexander Volkov, plus 125. They're both future title challengers in my mind. Volkov, in theory, has less time to do it. I kind of hate that one of them is going to be eliminated here because this is a definite eliminator in my mind, David. Uh, gone undefeated. Volkov in the best form of his career. Volkov 33-8. and eight, Gone 8-0. Eight and oh. David, who do you have in the main event this week? So Volkov and Gone. I When this fight got announced, I was extremely excited. This is two... Ex, you know, experienced heavyweights, even though gone is eight and oh, he has shown like a vast amount of experience in that octagon with with the um, way he can mix in his takedowns, his footwork. Like he he's very elusive for the heavyweight division as like counter Tanner Bozer. That was a great fight when it did happen back, a, you know, a few fights ago. And so but with with uh, Volkov. His his takedown defense, I think the, the reason why his takedown defense, the percentage is so low is because of that Curtis Blades fight. I don't think that before that, I think it was a lot higher. I think Gon's going to have to work harder than his other uh, opponents to be able to get him down to the floor. But we haven't seen Gon in those, those five-round fights yet. I think Volkov, with his experience, is going to be able to keep him at the end of the, his punches and then edge it out by decision. But I think it's going to be a very close fight if if Volkov can keep it off the floor. I can't wait to see it. And I always make excuses for Volkov, Kenny, with that Blades fight because it was a COVID-19 fight. He he had to take it. He had no wrestling training partners, none of the guys that he would have br brought in or traveled to go get. So, um, But I know you're pretty high on Gon, Kenny. What do you think about what we're going to see here on uh, Saturday night? You know, Volkov um, is going to be a problem for a lot of people just based on his toughness, his reach, his height. Um, the dude hits hard, um, you know, is really improving as a mixed martial artist as well. Uh, has learned a lot in a short amount of time, it seems, as a grappler specifically. Um, but I do think that Cyril Gunn, um, his intelligence is what really separates him from a lot of the guys in that division. He just – he has the right approach. He knows how to mix in – um, his strikes, his grappling at the right time, um, understands distance and range. Uh, you don't really see him take a whole lot of damage, and that's in the heavyweight division. That, that to me, is rare. Uh, and, you know, he can also actually land a lot of shots and hurt a lot of guys as a result. So I, I think that's that's impressive in the heavyweight division. I, I like Cyril Gaon here. Um, geez, Volkov is a guy who is very, very tough to put away. Um, but I do think that Volkov, uh, after being down a few rounds, is going to have to step up, get aggressive, perhaps overly aggressive, and maybe run into something from Cyril Gunn. Uh, I think Cyril Gunn gets the finish here in the fourth round by TKO. And I think given the standings, Ken Flo, you almost have to go Cyril Gunn at this point in yeah. time. I was thinking maybe the punishment would be that we make you shave your beard. <laughs> Oh, actually, that's, do that's it. pretty good. I would not want to do that. Right. Uh, I, like I know you wouldn't. As much as possible. Yeah. So I, when was the last time you actually put 
a Gillette blade or any blade to, to your face? Actually, uh, probably it was maybe a couple months before COVID maybe. Uh, so a couple years ago, maybe something like that. I had a shave and like my daughter was like, who is, right. who is this I, right. guy? Yeah. I got to say though, the upside now is that you have a newborn baby and dude, there is nothing like having a fresh shave with the newborn yes. baby, the head on the chin. So if you're leaning into the positives of shaving your beard, I would think that would be it. Um, <laughs> David, before we get you out of here uh, at featherweight, we have a fight between Andre Feely minus two thirty, and Daniel, the pit Pineda plus plus one eighty. I just need a quick pick for the record. Uh, you going with Feely or Daniel Pineda? I like Feely in this one. All right. And Ken flow Feely Pineda. Who do you have? Pineda can be dangerous early, but uh, I like Feely to win this one. All right, David Hansen can be found on social media at D Hansen MMA. Thanks for coming on, my man. Appreciate the analysis and the work, and uh, we'll be seeing what you're throwing out there on Twitter. But we appreciate you joining us today, sir. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on, and I hope to do it again soon. Sounds Thanks, good, dude. my man. All right, David Hansen with us for today's main event challenge. Can you imagine Ken Flo shaving the head? It's almost like, when am I doing TV, right? Because, I mean, if you ask right. me, when was the last time I went on TV with, like, nothing on my face, no beard, no mustache? Like, I don't even want to think about that. I have to be, like, 138 pounds to just not look like a big fucking fat face piece of shit, you know? <laughs> Lies. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see what happens with the uh, punishment for the uh, for the main event challenge. Ken Flo could rally as he's done in two of his wins, so you just never know. Um all right, Forrest Griffin coming up here in a minute. Yeah, we're going to roll all this into the show. Ken Flo, your buddy Forrest Griffin was just talking about just, you know, how you're a fashion icon and you spend a lot of time in California, and so it's okay to have a baby when you're like 45. I was just saying congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that, that's normal. By like Hollywood standards, you're like normal, totally normal. <laughs> the problem is, is that like at 65, I'm going to be like limping towards – my kid, it's going to be bad. I still, you know, I need to be able to kick my son's ass for a long time. And what, that's, yeah, you know, so you have, I have otherwise he doesn't respect me. I have uh, a daughter, that? so it's totally different. But right. if you have a son, like, what is that dynamic? You do actually have to be able to physically handle them. I have to. I need to instill fear. I need, yeah. Yeah, I need to instill fear at some point. My daughter's sweet as can be, but uh, my son, it, it takes a different approach, I think. So. It looks like yeah. Forrest just went black on us, but I still hear no. you loud and clear. But Forrest, no, like no, Enflo is going to show up. I, there I, he I is. I'm just trying to get my Wi-Fi squared away. So I would joke about this because I had a son at a very advanced age. And, you know, it's like, oh, oh, Archer, Florian, that's great. Your grandfather showed up to the soccer game today. It's like, no, no, that's my dad. That's my dad. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, he doesn't have a white hair on his head. And neither do you, Forrest. I mean – is there any white, any gray hair at all on your head? My God. Yeah, there's some. I think it looks good myself. It makes <laughs> me look a little smarter, I think. I mean, you know, like, oh, that guy, he might know a thing or two. So uh, so Kenny actually just moved to uh, to Charlotte, North Carolina, which is that not is far so from where weird. you are. What a weird place to go, Kenny. Right uh -huh. there. We call it NASCAR <laughs> or something now? Did you finally get the gig with NASCAR? You did, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not the biggest NASCAR fan, but uh, I think I, I, you know, LA was getting a little crazy for me. So, yeah, yeah, I, I actually love, um, I, I love North Carolina altogether. Yeah, yeah, I think he made a good decision. I, at one point, um, that typing was distracting me, but at one point, Kenny was considering Nashville, and I was like, dude, way too much fucking noise in Nashville. <laughs> Charlotte's so, a great town. I love so, it so far. Forrest, it is great to see you. You know, usually we bring you on like every 100 episodes, you know? So it's episode 305. We missed by a little bit. But um, there's so I guess I'll start with you flying this $25 million aircraft because you posted a photo on Instagram and we see your name on the side of the plane. And, I mean, do you have a background flying? How did this all come together? No. All right. So, you know, um, Everything happens uh, like four or five years ago. I was going to do a thing for the Air Force Reserves and a thing. And I signed up to to fly on this, the, to basically to fly with the Thunderbirds, like the number one, you know, exhibition show plane place in the world. 
and uh, totally forgot about it. And then they called me up and they said, hey, you have to get a mes- medical in the next two weeks. You're flying with the Thunderbirds. They didn't ask, like, is this still something you still want to do? <laughs> they were just like, get your stuff together. We need you here on this date. You got to get all this paperwork done so you can come on base and get in the airplane. And I was like, well, you know, you, you have to you have to take advantage of these life experiences when you get yeah. them. So, of course, I did it. It was amazing. Um, the one thing I'll say is if you think you passed out, don't ask if you passed out because then people know you passed out. Right. I saw the footage of me passing out and it wasn't that bad. You couldn't really tell that I was passing wow. out. I probably could have BS'd around it had I seen the footage first, but I was like, oh, wait, how long was I out for? And they were like, mm, two seconds. I was like, oh, okay, good, good. That's fine. Wow. But yeah, it was amazing. They actually let you fly the plane. You can't even believe it. It is, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, you know, it's the coolest thing in the world, right? It's a once in a life experience. It was pretty amazing. That is awesome. So, um, I, I always throw up. I did throw up. Wow. Oh. Oh, so out. when you did, when you throw up, where did you throw up? Like, do you throw up into that tube? Do you throw up all over yourself? What? No, they, they give you a bag. They're like, here's your okay, bag. All right. And the thing is, when you're actually flying, there's so much adrenaline in your body. They told me most people fly on the, the ride back when you're not really doing anything. And sure enough, I threw up on the way back. Like, my stomach was upset the whole time, which was really the only thing that wasn't great about it. But, um, yeah, on the way back, when your body starts to shuttle down, Basically, your body's got too much going on to even throw up when you're actually in the air pulling G's. Right. So what's the feeling like, though? Is, is it like being like I get sick on a boat? Is that the same thing or is it like such an intense yeah. speed and directional thing that it's just throwing you off? Like, are you dizzy? Are you like, what are you feeling? Well, so, yeah, I don't love I don't love like, you know, the kind of movement stuff. I don't love that. Um, you know, cause I'm, cause I'm old, you know, in our advanced age, our, our equilibrium's not what it should be. Um, but yeah, it's like that. But then once you look out and you see like the canopy of the open sky or the ground, depending on which way you're, you're going, or you're like in a bullet looking straight at the ground, you kind of forget all that. And it's like amazing. The first feeling I got was claustrophobia because those things are tiny and like the cutoff to be a pilot is six, five. Well, I'm I'm six three, so it's like wow. Wow, I'm I'm kind of right there, <laughs> you yeah. know. And, Man, like, literally, you're like, oh my god, this is so small. All pilots should be five six. That, that's I, why Tom Cruise was such a good uh, Top Gun fighter pilot. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I would rather take an amateur mixed martial arts fight than get in that airplane. I mean, there is no way, no way. Can you no, get it's, me a, up there? it's amazing. It's amazing. Thankfully, people aren't coming my way with those once in a lifetime opportunities. Hey, so. I always say to people for us, like the best part of my job is when a guy like Brandon Moreno breaks through and becomes a first time UFC champion. And I know, you know, a lot of these guys super well. And I mean, I know, you know how nice a guy he is, but dude, like the best part of this job is seeing something like that. And uh, I think anybody who saw him that fight, we've kind of had a feeling like he had put in the right work and he was, he was going to break through. What'd you think of Brandon? Uh, you know, I, I loved it. I'll be lying if I said I didn't get a, a little emotional. And it was like, you know, the thing that makes real men cry. And, and I would say that that was, you know, that, that was true for me. I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm like watching the fights by myself on an iPad <laughs> late at night. Like, you right, know, right. It, it, was, it was pretty cool. It was surreal. Um, I've actually known him and his coach and his gym for about uh, probably a decade, you know, since before he was in. UFC and then he got cut and then you know, when he came back you know I thought that was just such a good story you know the last pick on tough right uh getting eliminated getting getting a fight getting cut you know and, and then just coming back and becoming a champion and then if you look at his talent though and his skill and, and his his body he's changed he's done the work you know he's done the work he's he's done the work and played with the Legos so it's it's right, uh, right. Let's give the man credit Forrest, what's the latest over at the UFC PI, man? Oh, they're cranking. You know, with, with fights in town almost every week. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're just just giving athletes today, fighters. See, we don't even say fighters anymore. Athletes today, the kind of treatment that you only wish you could have gotten. So, <laughs> it's amazing. Next time you're in town, stop in. I'll... I'll uh, I'll, I will be in a couple yeah. weeks before the Conor McGregor fight. I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be cornering Ryan Hall for his next fight. So, 
I'm excited, man, to check it out. Um, what, what's the what's the protocol right now for teams? Can any team go in in there at any point right now, or what's what's the deal with them? Yeah, right now there's a limit of three training partners, so you can bring well, actually four, you know, because you have the co-main events that have four, so we kind of let everybody have four. Okay. But, and then we have like a COVID testing protocol, and we have some bubble policies that are enforced on starting Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we keep basically the fight week athletes separate from the non-fight week athletes. But And then our physical therapists and, and sports dietitians, they go to the hotel and they, you know, they wow. play with the athletes there. So it's it's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. No, it is amazing. It is amazing. That's cool. And, um, you know, if you are a UFC fighter and you haven't tried it out, you know, your next fight week, Tuesday, when they're like, hey, will you be using blah, 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 just say yes to all of it. Yes, I want all of it. Right. We want, I don't but, know, but give me all of it. Definitely. Did you guys ever talk in the early stages about, man, what if like 350 of these athletes legitimately moved to Vegas? Like, because a lot of them are doing it. So that's, no, what we thought is like, we're going to have to build like six of these, aren't we? <laughs> right. That's <laughs> right. Oh, you know, we're going to build one in Mexico City. Europe needs one. Brazil uh, desperately needs one, you know. We we thought we we got to turn into a franchise. We got to be like a McDonald's or something, you know. We got to yeah. start pop up locations around the world. You know, Russia they want one in Russia. You know, right? It's, it's awesome, yeah. Because I mean, there are a lot of high profile athletes, and and obviously there's plenty of space. But uh, I don't know. I just always thought if you're on this roster and you're not taking advantage of that, that I mean, forget during fight week, right? I mean, anybody can come out and go through the VO2 max capacity testing and all that. I mean. I, like I don't, I don't even dare want to ask how many athletes on the roster have never stepped foot in there. I even know? think it's something like I had to buy a, an octagon, like I had to buy a cage to put into Florian Martial Arts Center when I was fighting. Like, you know what I mean? Like, think about all the things that you save money wise, and your ability to be able to train under those conditions and have access to all that stuff is is pretty damn cool, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's best in class on every level. But, but the, you know, you still have to do your MMA. The, the other thing I wanted to follow up on is if you think about the way martial arts or fighting is done, there's almost subtle regional differences in the training habits. So um, I think that's one of, the thing, one of the reasons why we need more performance institutes around the world is not just the language and the cultural differences, but the training differences. But And that has actually been one of the best things about COVID is we've gotten hundreds of athletes, UFC athletes and training partners from around the world. And we've gotten to kind of see them train and how they run their camp. And what a lot of people do is because the fights are always in Vegas, they come, well, I'll just come out two or three weeks early, get acclimated. Cause you know, I'm in, I'm in Russia right now. I need to be on that, that time zone. I need to be at that altitude, get used to it. And I'll just use the performance Institute for the last bit of my camp and bring my people. So We've gotten to see just, you know, and the differences aren't as subtle as I think. People really do train martial arts very differently uh, around the world. So it's pretty been pretty interesting for me. If if I, um, I really wish I would have kept better track of it. Yeah. <laughs> who's doing who's do what, where? Like, what? Huh, that's amazing. Well, my grandfather told me 20 years ago, dude, if you just suck it up and write two sentences about your every day in 10 years, you'll have a memoir and, uh, I have done that like three days over the last 10 years. So uh, UFC Hall of Famer, former light heavyweight champion Forrest Griffin with us here on the Anakin Florian podcast. So uh, Francis Ngannou, I mean, a lot of us thought it was an eventuality that he would break through and become the UFC heavyweight champion. And I guess my question is not about Derek Lewis or Stipe, um, but about like how big a superstar you actually think this man can be. I mean, it would seem to me like a major motion, motion picture about his life obviously has to happen, but I think a lot of these things are somewhat predicated upon his ability to defend this belt and, and the black beast might have a lot to say about that in a few months. Yeah. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Well, first off, yes, Francis is huge. He's a superstar. His story is amazing. Um, I won't bother to, to tell it to you either hear from him or I believe there's a documentary about his story, but yeah, it's amazing. You know, when he tells the story about like the seventh time he tried to get across the ocean, right? right. Like, what? what is this is crazy like where's the where's the hollywood script guy writing this stuff down right. but let's look at that first fight um so he was working actually at syndicate for that fight and my belief is that when uh, francis threw a kick early in that fight that he didn't set up just like a naked kick which sometimes you do early in fights and sometimes you pay for it and i believe that Derek lewis hit him a little bit and he felt something that he wasn't used to feeling he he felt a little bit of like oh that guy, that guy can hurt me back. 
Yeah. And if we've seen Derek Lewis, that's a thing. So look back at the first maybe two minutes of that first fight. And I think that's why it ended up being such a stalemate, because we don't like to say boring fight. Such right. a stalemate. Right. A tactical, right. a tactical I'm gonna steal that. nullification. Yeah. Is a tactical nullification there. And <laughs> I, I believe that is because he threw that kick that wasn't set up properly. Derek Lewis touched him just a little bit and he said, Okay, there's a guy that can hurt me back. I'm not so used to that. And then the way he fought, um, who's the guy that just knocked the other guy out with the front of Sur- from Surinam? What's his name? Oh, Jarzinho Rose 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 Rose. Yeah. He 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 charged across like he had no respect for Rosenstruth's power. And that man just he he doesn't even touch people in the areas you would think that cause knockouts. Right. He touches people like glancing headshots and they're like falling unconscious and You're right he, he charged across at that guy i thought that was crazy so yeah. um yeah you know that's interesting but tactical we nullification got we got a great yeah we got a great matchup this weekend cyril Gunn is a guy Good. just because of his physique I, I must say i started watching him and then watching him move and i've gotten to see him spar a couple times and like the footwork for a man that size, the reaction time, et cetera. It's pretty impressive. So, um, and you know, he came out of the same gym that Francis started then. Right. And he's with, he's still with those guys. So I think that's an interesting story, maybe, you know, for the future to keep your eye on. Oh, there's no doubt. After we see how it does this weekend against uh, Volkov. Fernand Lopez potentially cornering against Francis and Gano. I mean, be very interesting uh, if that were to materialize. And yeah, man, like heavyweight is really interesting right now. I hate to be the guy who says I hate that one of these guys has to lose this weekend, but this version of Volkov uh, is an absolute animal and a great test for Cyril Gan right now. All right, a couple more things here with Forrest. And b- by the way, if it is in Ganu and Derek Lewis, like you absolutely just helped me with my pay per view open with uh, tactical nullification. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, all right. So. Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor fought in 2014. Then it took seven years for them to fight again up a weight class. So it seems sort of an interesting juxtaposition that they go seven years between meetings and then now just six months between meetings. I think Conor can be encouraged by the fact that it is a game of millimeters and he was close to landing the seminal blow in the second fight. But most people I talk to for us just don't feel like it's enough time for Connor to make the adjustments. I feel like Connor can dust anybody in a couple minutes. I'm, I'm not asking for a lean, but how do you handicap this third meeting between uh, between Connor and Dustin? Well, let's look at two things you mentioned there. One, uh, it was really one one adjust. There's one adjustment that Connor needs to make, and that's defending the calf kick. That set everything up. Um, I think I watched somebody's breakdown, and, and uh, Connor was actually flinchy with the legs when he got caught with the punch. The other thing, though, that I don't think you said that Connor was missing by millimeters. I feel like he landed some shots on Poirier and Poirier was able to eat them. And I thought that was the difference. When Poirier was like, oh, wow, I took that shot. I think maybe for him that changed things. And, you know, there's all the talk about what happens to your chin at what weight class. And, you know, we. Well, I mean, Connor was taking, or excuse me, Poirier was taking big shots from Connor. And, you know, not only did he stay conscious, but he was able to knock Connor out and uh, just, you know, obviously stay on the calf kicks, the, the, the ever dreaded calf kick. But I think that those are the two things that are big in that fight is that Poirier took that power. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point. And Dustin going in there all filled out 180 pounds and uh, certainly better equipped to take a shot than, uh, than at 45. All right, so before I let you go, the Atlanta Hawks are in the Eastern Conference Finals. I mean, to what extent do you give a shit about the NBA outfit in your former hometown? Well, first off, this is the first I'm hearing about it. Second <laughs> off, yes, go Hawks. There I used you go. to love the I was I was Kevin Willis, Dominique yeah. Wilkins. You know, I was I was the biggest Hawks fan in the 90s. Unfortunately for me, uh Stacy Ogden, the plastic man, got a uh Muke Blaylock for a while. Oh, yeah. look at you. Look at you. I, no, I was 90s NBA basketball. There's a there's a spread where that's that's everything I did. I still have all these guys' rookie cards. If anybody's interested in buying them, I'll just put that out there. But that's good. Uh, I'm excited for the Hawks then. I'm I'm gonna watch. I love I love the last quarter of a playoff game. No, well, that's the rub right there. I have no use for the regular season in the NBA as well. Like, I can't sit down and watch a non-playoff game. So I'm with you there. 
Uh, Mookie Blaylock. You didn't think you'd hear that name today. Number 10 in your program, number one in your hat. Um, Forrest, but seriously, Trey Young is the best player on the Hawks, right? He's a young kid, third year in the league, I think. And uh, they're in the final four, man. So maybe uh, start paying attention. They play at like four o'clock your time, but, you know. I will. I will. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. Oh, Hawks. Well, uh, hey, thanks for the time. It's always good to see your smiling face. And uh, hopefully the three of us can connect at some point in Vegas next month. I would love that. Hit me up. Also, happy Father's Day to you, too. Uh, congratulations, Ken. It's such to cool you thing. as well, brother. That you to can you still well. do that at your age. That's just the base. <laughs> <laughs> <It's a tough laughs> <idea. laughs> I had to. I had to. You got to do it. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks, buddy. We'll see you soon. All right, guys. Thank you, dude. <laughs> there he is. The great, inimitable UFC Hall of Famer, Forrest Griffin. Are you liking them trotting out all this old Ultimate Fighter footage? I guess when you knock out Chris Lieben with an elbow, you're okay when they repurpose that. Footage. Well, it's funny because I've been getting a lot of different messages from people. I'm like, where are people seeing this? Why is the yeah. Ultimate Fighter coming up again? But they they put it on uh, on the ESPN Plus app. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's like, it's almost like I'm, I'm getting new fans in some way. Probably some new haters yeah. as well. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so that that's kind of cool. I think. Yeah, I think for a lot of the young fans, right, who are just three years in or maybe, you know, the and they are watching UFC fights. You, you just don't know the legend of Kenny Ford. And uh, if you don't know, maybe now you know. Ultimate Fighter, 19, 1985, <laughs> the first <laughs> right. season. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you like Ken Flo's dad cap, anticflorianpodcast.com is where you can get it. Don't forget FlowTube, Ken Flo's YouTube channel. Oh. Still haven't. Thanks. Put the flow tube at the top. Don't be afraid to steal the <laughs> flow tube. Um, yeah. Do you have a show for the uh, Premier Fighters Legion on <laughs> the Premier Fighters Legion? <laughs> Are you going to Jersey? The professional Fighters League. Yes, right. we. I'm do. sorry. We do. No, no, no. We, we do. We got the we got the women's 155, and we got the heavyweights going at it. Uh, and this will determine who gets into the playoffs uh, or the semifinals. So does that mean Kayla Harris is fighting week. Thursday night? What's that? Is Kayla Harrison fighting Thursday night? She is indeed. Oh, she is indeed. I'm having She's a, a Kayla Harrison party at my house. If you I'm see her in South it. Florida, you better go the other way. Don't challenge her, bro. I want to hug Kayla. I want to Don't hug challenge her. her. Okay. All right. She thanks might throw everybody. You too, I know. She could toss me yeah. with yeah. relative toss me. ease. Yeah, she could. All right. Thanks, yeah. everybody, for <laughs> indulging us. Thanks to our guests, uh, David Hansen and Ray Longo, and, of course, Forrest Griffin, who you just heard from. So next week, it will not be in the traditional Monday slot. But the audio will be repurposed on iTunes and everywhere where you get your podcasts. And there will be obviously a video Whoa. that will be live in addition to uh, to repurposed on, on the YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. Feel free to start firing questions to, to Cody or at Anik Florian Pod or whatever the hell you want. Um, be creative. Uh, and we look forward to uh, going back and forth with you guys next week. Um, you got anything else or can we get the hell out of here? Dude, that's it, kid. Great. Good All stuff. Right. All right. Well, uh, don't have any more kids. Uh, and <laughs> thanks to Cody for putting this all together. For Ken Flom, John Annex, and so long for now. Uh, until we convene again, do not text and drive. And uh, Militich, how nice is it? No masks, right? Fucking nationwide. <laughs> Yo, later. <laughs>